introduction to the law of the honey bee this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the law of the honey bee by tickna edwards introduction the oldest craft under the sun one of the oldest and prettiest fables in ancient mythology is that which deals with the origin of the honey-bee it was to melissa and her sister amalthea the beautiful daughters of the king of crete that the god jupiter was entrusted by his mother ops when saturn his father following his custom of devouring his children at birth sought to make the usual meal of this his latest offspring the story is variously rendered by ancient writers some say that bees already existed in the world and that amalthea was only a goat whose milk served to nourish the baby god in addition to the honey that melissa obtained from the wild bees in the cave where jupiter lay hidden another account has it that the bees themselves were drawn to his place of concealment by the noise made by his nurses who beat continually on brazen pans to keep the sound of his infant lamentations from the ears of his ravening sire thenceforward the bees took over the charge of him bringing him daily rations of honey until he grew up and was able to hold his own in the olympian theogony in either case jupiter showed his gratitude towards his preservers in true celestial fashion it was a very ancient belief among the earliest writers that in the single instance of the honey-bee the ordinary male and female principle was abrogated and that the propagation of the species took place by miraculous means in explanation of this we are told it was a special gift from jupiter in acknowledgment of the unique service rendered him in one version of the fable and in the words of a famous bee-master who wrote in sixteen fifty seven jupiter for so great a benefit bestowed on his nurses for a reward that they should have young ones and continue their kind without wasting themselves in venery in the other and probably much older form of the legend melissa the beautiful princess of crete was herself changed by the god into a bee with the like immaculate propensities and thenceforward the work of collecting honey for the food of man that honey which down to a very few centuries from the present time was universally believed to be a miraculous secretion from heaven was confided to her descendants apart however from the old dim tales of ancient mythology where there is a romance to account for all beginnings of the world and everything upon it any attempt to trace back the art of bee-keeping to its earliest inception cannot fail to bring us to the conclusion that it is inevitably and literally the oldest craft under the sun thousands of years before the great pyramid was built bee-keeping must have been an established and traditional occupation of man it must have been common knowledge stamped with the authority of the ages that a beehive besides its toiling multitudes contained a single large ruling bee divine exemplar of royalty for how else would the bee have been chosen to represent a king in the egyptian hieroglyphic symbols but it is not only within the limits of historical times however remote 
that evidences of bee culture or at least of man's use of honey and wax in his daily life are to be found or inferred so far back as the bronze age it is certain that wax was used in casting ornaments and weapons a model of the implement was first made in some material that would perish under heat this was embedded in clay and the model burnt out after which the mould thus formed was filled with the molten metal these models no doubt were in many cases carved out of wood but it is certain that another and more ductile material was often used bronze ornaments have been found with thumb marks upon them obviously chance impressions on the original model faithfully reproduced and the substance of these models could hardly have been anything else than beeswax but speculation on the probable antiquity of beekeeping need not stop here the best authorities estimate that human life has existed on the earth for perhaps a hundred thousand years the earliest traces of man far back in the twilight of paleolithic times reveal him as a hunting and fighting animal in whom the instinct to cultivate the soil or domesticate the creatures about him had not yet developed later on in the stone age but still in infinitely remote times it is evident that he tamed several creatures such as the ox the sheep and the goat keeping them in confinement and killing them for food as he required it instead of resorting to the old ceaseless roaming after wild game at this time too he took to sowing corn and even baking or charring some sort of bread it must be remembered that if a hundred thousand years is to be set down as the limit of man's life on the earth probably the development of other living creatures as well as most forms of vegetable life took place immeasurably earlier the chances are that the world of trees and flowering plants in which aboriginal man moved differed in no great degree from the world of green things surrounding human life today it is certain that the apple pear raspberry blackberry and plum were common fruits of the countryside in the later stone age for seeds of all these have been found in conjunction with neolithic remains evidence of the existence of the beech and elm the latter a famous pollen yielder has been discovered at a very much earlier time all the conditions favourable to insect life must have been present in the world ages before man appeared in it and insect life undoubtedly existed then in a high state of development it would be as unreasonable therefore not to infer that the honey-bee was ready on the earth with her store of sweet food for man as that man did not speedily discover that store and make it an object of his daily search just as he went forth daily to hunt and kill four-footed game there is of course a great deal of difference between a chance discovery of a wild bee's nest as a common and expected incident in a day's foraging and the systematic preservation and tending of beehives as a source of daily food while it is reasonable to assume that the first men used honey as an article of diet it is probable that they were a wandering race never halting for long in the same locality and therefore unlikely to be beekeepers in the accepted sense of the word they depended no doubt on the wild honey stores which they happened to find in their entourage for the time being 
but the first sign of civilization must have been the gradual lessening of the nomadic instinct tribes would come to take permanent possession of districts rich in the game as well as the fruits and tubers necessary for their daily food at the same time the haunts of the wild bees would be discovered their enemies kept down or driven away the places where the swarms pitched annually noted and thus the first apiary would have been founded probably long before any attempt at cultivation of the soil or domestication of the wild creatures for food was made biologists generally regard hunting as the oldest human enterprise under the sun but adopting their well-known method of deductive reasoning it seems possible to make out a rather better case for beemanship in this category the primeval huntsman must have found much difficulty in bringing down his game and still more in securing it when maimed but yet capable of eluding final capture for this purpose some sort of retrieving animal fleeter of foot and more cunning than its master must have been even more necessary in primeval times than it is in the modern days of the gun there seems to be no evidence of man indicating the most elementary civilization without sure signs also that he had trained and used some sort of dog to help him in his daily food forays but man must have existed long before civilization can be said to have come within age-long distance of him in these times beset with enemies he must have built his hut nest-like in some high impregnable tree out of reach of night prowling foes and it is scarcely conceivable that the dog was his companion under these conditions more probably he lived for the most part on fruits and honeycomb and such of the small creatures as he could capture with his naked hands thus in all likelihood the first hunter was a bee hunter eolithic man may have had his own rocky fastness or clump of hollow trees where the wild bees congregated and with the coming of each summer he may have followed his swarms through the glades of primeval forests as zealously as any beekeeper of the present day speculation of this kind is necessarily far-fetched and fantastic and can be but half seriously undertaken with so small and inconsiderable a creature as the honey-bee but it is interesting from one special and not often adopted point of view there is no more fascinating study than that of the ancient civilizations of the world egypt ten thousand years ago babylon probably still earlier china that seems to have stopped at finite perfection in all ways that matter little ages before the time of abraham but all these are of mushroom growth compared with the antiquity of bee civilization it is only a tale of lilliput of a microscopic people living and moving on a mimic stage yet perhaps tens of thousands of years before man had made fire or chipped a flint into an axe head these winged nations had evolved a perfect plan of life and solved social problems such as are only just beginning to cloud the horizon of human existence in the twentieth century and they and their intricate communal polity have not passed away into dust as the great human nations of bygone ages have done and as those of the present day may be destined to do for all we can tell 
will a time come when we must learn from the honey-bee or perish we have still probably a few thousand years wherein to think it out and prepare for it but unless the world comes to an end or human increasing and multiplying comes to an end one earth will eventually become too small to hold us with this thought in mind a study of the honey-bee and the arrangements of hive life takes on a new interest supposing that the political economy of a beehive may be taken as a foreshadowing of the ultimate human state there is no denying that we get a glimpse into an eminently disquieting state of things at least from the masculine point of view we see matriarchy triumphant the females holding supreme control in the state and not only initiating all rules of public conduct but designing and carrying through all public works the male is reduced to the one indispensable office of sex and even a single exercise of this is vouchsafed only to a few in a thousand but to create the large and permanent army of workers necessary in a state such as this and to recruit it wholly from the females it became necessary to revise all rules of life from their very foundation there must have been a great renunciation among the bees male and female alike when the resolve was made to leave the whole duty of procreation of their kind to one pair alone of their number one pair only out of every thirty thousand or so in order that the rest could devote themselves to ceaseless sexually unincommoded toil this may be imagined as following on a great discovery an epoch-making discovery changing the whole face and future of bee life how by the nursing and feeding of the young grub of the female bee she could be atrophied into a mere sexless over-intellectual labourer or glorified into a creature lacking it is true all initiative and almost all mental power but possessing a body capable of mothering the whole nation here is a socialistic political economy carried to its sternest most logical conclusions all is sacrifice for the good of the state the individual is nothing the race is everything thorough is the motto of the honey-bee and she drives every theory home to its last notch men are pleased to call themselves bee masters but the best of them can do no more than study the ways of their bees learn in what directions it is their will to move and then try to smooth the way for them the worker bees collectively are the whole brains in the business and the beekeeper is as much the slave of the conditions and systems they have inaugurated as they are themselves while the queen bee is the most willing and at certain seasons the most laborious slave of them all it is useless to deny that bee polity with its stern dead reckoning of ingenuity its merciless adherence to the demands of a system perfected through countless ages has its unpleasant and even its revolting aspects nature is always wonderful but not always admirable and a close study of the life within the hive brings out this truth perhaps more clearly than with any other form of life humanity not accepted absolute communism implies incidental cruelty it is only under a system of bland political compromise of neighbourly give and take 
that justice and mercy can ever be yoke fellows in the republic of bees nothing is allowed to persist that is harmful or useless to the general good every individual in the hive seems to acquiesce in this common principle either by choice or compulsion from the mother bee down to the last lazy drone born into the brief plenty of waning summer days in the height of the honey flow the state demands a storehouse filled to the brim and every bee keeps herself to the task unceasingly until death from overwork comes upon her and her last load never reaches the hive if the queen bee grows old or her powers of egg-laying prematurely fail she is ruthlessly slaughtered and her place filled by another specially raised by the workers to meet this contingency during her lifetime and in her full view drones are bred in plenty plied with the richest provender in the hive and allowed to wanton through their days of insatiate appetite so that no young queen may go forth on her nuptial flight unchallenged but when the last princess is happily mated and safely home again in the warm awaiting cluster every drone is callously done to death or driven out of the hive to perish if hard times threaten or the supply of stores is arrested the old and worn-out members of the hive are exterminated breeding is stopped the unborn young are torn from their cradle cells and destroyed so that there may be as few mouths as possible to fill in the lean days to come the signs of dawning prosperity or adversity are watched for and the working population of the hive is either increased or checked just as future probabilities seem to indicate but the most bewildering most uncanny thing of all about this bee republic is the fact that in it has been successfully solved the problem of the balance of the sexes while all other creatures in the universe bring forth their kind male and female in what seems a haphazard unpremeditated way these mysterious hive people cause their queen mother to give them either sons or daughters according to the needs of the community they lead her to the drone cells and she forthwith deposits eggs that hatch out infallibly as drones and in the combs specially made wherein to rear the aborted females the workers the queen is caused to lay eggs that just as assuredly produce only the worker bee it is the oldest civilization in the world this wonderful commonwealth of the bee people and it is not unprofitable to examine it in the light of ideas which are at present only flickering up uncertainly on the distant path but which might well broaden out some day into general conflagration it is conceivable that a time existed when the conditions of bee life were very different from those we see today bees have drawn together into vast communities just as men are slowly but surely gathering into cities a time may come when individual existence outside the city may be as impracticable for men as life has become for separate bee families away from the hive and then there may arise a purely masculine dilemma it may be that once the magnificent drone was of real consequence in domestic affairs bee life may have consisted of numberless small families each with its deep-voiced ponderous father bee its fruitful mother and its tribe of youngsters growing up and in time 
setting forth to establish homes for themselves there is no reason why each one of the thirty or forty thousand pinched virgins in a hive should not have become a fully developed prolific queen bee if only the right food in sufficient quantity had been given her in her larval state but the need for the single large community arose the system of a single national mother was instituted the great renunciation was made for good or ill and then the trouble from the masculine point of view began it must be borne in mind that strictly speaking the honey-bee does not and never did possess a sting what is commonly known as her sting is really an ovipositor and it is as such that it is almost exclusively used by the modern queen bee in every hive today but when the first hordes of worker bees were brought into the world reduced by the science of starvation to little more than sexless sinews and brains they seem to have conceived a terrible revenge on their ancestors the useless ovipositor was turned into a weapon of offence against which the drone's magnificent panoply of sound and fury availed him nothing matriarchy was established at the point of the living sword a pitiless logic overran everything intolerance of all the brighter sides of life the wine the dance the merry talk and genial tarryings by the path beloved of all drones bee or human darken the day and the result is only more honey a vaster storehouse filled to the brim with never to be tasted sweets at a cost unfathomable when the old larder would have sufficed for every real need and life might still have been merry and leisurely it is only a fable far-fetched fantastic as any told to the caliph in the arabian nights but there again the woman had her way like the bee woman before and some day she and her kind may get it on a more ambitious scale and then what of the sword that was once a sewing needle end of introduction Chapter One of the Law of the Honey Bee by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ancients and the Honey Bee. While great Caesar hurled war's lightnings by high Euphrates, even in that season I, Virgil, nurtured in sweet Parthenope, went in the ways of lowly quiet from the fourth book of the georgics it was in naples the parthenope of the ancients that the best poem by the best poet was written nearly two thousand years ago essentially an apostle of the simple life the cultured and courtly virgil chose to live a quiet rural existence among his lemon groves and his beehives when he might have dwelt in the very focus of honour at the roman capital where his friend and patron mycenas the prime minister of octavian kept open house for all the great in literature and art modern beekeepers athirst for the americanization of everything give little heed nowadays to the writings of one whom bacon has called the chastest poet and royalist that to the memory of man is known and yet if the question were asked what book should first be placed in the hands of the beginner in apiculture today 
no wiser choice than this fourth book of the georgics could be made for virgil goes direct to the great heart of the matter which is the same today as it was two thousand years ago the beekeeper must be first of all a bee lover or he will never succeed and virgil's love for his bees shines through his book from beginning to end of course in a writer so deeply under the spell of grecian influences it is to be expected that such a work would faithfully reproduce most of the errors immortalized by aristotle some three hundred years before but these only serve to bring the real value of the book into stronger relief through the rich incrustation of poetic fancy and the fragrant mythological garniture we cannot fail to see the true bee lover writing directly out of his own knowledge gathered at first hand among his own bees virgil knew and lovingly recorded all that eyes and ears could tell him about bee life and it is only within the last two hundred years or so that any new fact has been added to virgil's store all the writers on apiculture from the earliest times down to the eighteenth century have done little else than pass from hand to hand the fantastic errors of the ancient bee fathers adding generally still more fantastic speculations of their own and until skirak got together his little band of patient investigators of hive life about a hundred years ago virgil's fourth georgic considered as a practical guide to bee-keeping was still very nearly as well informed and up-to-date as any it is not however for its technical worth that the book is to be recommended to the apiarian tyro of to-day all that has become hopelessly old-fashioned with the passing of the ancient straw skep in the last generation the intrinsic value of virgil's writings lies in their atmosphere of poetry and romance which ought to be held inseparable now as ever from a craft which is probably the most ancient in the world almost alone among country occupations to-day beekeeping can retain much of its entrancing old-world flavour and yet live and thrive but if the modern tendency to make the usual unlovely transatlantic thing of british honey farming is to be checked nothing will do more to that end than an early installation of virgil's beautiful philosophy dipping into this fascinating poem with its delightful blend of carefully told fact and rich fancy and quaint garnerings from records then extant but now lost in the ages we can reconstruct for ourselves a picture of virgil's country retreat near sweet parnethope where he loitered and mused and wrought the faultless hexameters of the georgics with so much care and labour that the work took seven years to accomplish which is at the rate of less than a line a day virgil's house stood probably on the wooden slope above the town of naples deep set in orange groves and lemon plantations and in full view to the north of the snow pinnacled apennines and southward of the blue waters of the bay vesuvius too rose dark against the morning sun only a few leagues onward and at its foot the doomed cities nestled pompeii and herculaneum then with still a hundred years of busy life to run beehives in virgil's day 
as we can gather from certain ancient roman bas-reliefs still in existence were of a high peaked dome pattern and they were made of stitched bark or wattled osiers as he himself tells us many of the directions he gives as to their situation and surroundings are still golden rules for every beekeeper the bee garden he says must be sheltered from winds and placed where neither sheep nor butting kids may trample down the flowers trees must be near for their cool shade and to serve as resting places when the new crowned kings lead out their earliest swarms in the sweet springtime he tells us to place our hives near to water or where a light rivulet speeds through the grass and we are able to cast into the water large pebbles and willow branches laid crosswise that the bees when drinking may have bridges to stand on and spread their wings to the summer sun virgil's method of hiving a swarm is almost identical with that followed by old-fashioned beemen to this day the hive is to be scoured with crushed balm and honeywort and then you are to make a tinkling round about and clash the symbols of the mother that is of the goddess sibylle the bees will forthwith descend he tells us and occupy the prepared nest when the honey harvest is taken you are first to sprinkle your garments and cleanse your breath with pure water and then to approach the hives holding forth pursuing smoke in your hand and the old-time bee-man of to-day takes his mug of small beer as a necessary rite and washes himself before handling his hives but perhaps the great charm of the fourth georgic consists not in its nearness to truth about bee life but in the continual reference to the beautiful myths and hardly less attractive errors of immemorial times copied so faithfully by medieval writers but not apt to be heard of by the learner of to-day unless he reads the old books virgil begins his poem by speaking of heaven-born honey the gift of air in allusion to the belief that the nectar in flowers was not a secretion of the plant itself but fell like manna from the skies he seriously warns his readers of the disastrous effect of echoes on the denizens of a hive and of the hurtful nature of burnt crab shells and tells us that in windy weather bees will carry about little pebbles as counterpoises as ships take in sand ballast when they roll deep in the tossing surge he was a firm believer in the divine origin of bees to all the ancients the honey-bee was a perpetual miracle as much a sign and token of an omnipotent will set in the flowery meadows as is the rainbow to modern pietists set in the sky while all other creatures in the universe were seen to produce their kind by coition of the sexes these mysterious winged people seem to be exempt from the common law virgil copying from much older writers says they neither rejoice in bodily union nor waste themselves in love's languors nor bring forth their young by pain of birth but alone from the leaves and sweet-scented herbage they gather their children in their mouths thus sustaining their strength of tiny citizens just as marvellous however at least to the modern entomologist will appear the belief widespread among the ancients and shared by virgil that swarms of bees 
can be spontaneously generated from the decaying carcass of an ox virgil professes to derive his account of the matter from an old egyptian legend and he gives careful directions to beekeepers of what he seems never to doubt is an excellent method for stocking an apiary there is a very old translation of the passage in the fourth book of the georgics relating to these self-generated bees which is worth quoting if only on account of its quaint medieval savour first there is found a place small and narrowed for the very use shut in by a little tiled roof and closed walls through which the light comes in a scant through four windows facing the four points of the compass next is found a two-year-old bull calf whose crooked horns be just beginning to bud the beast his nose holes and breathing are stopped in spite of his much kicking and after he hath been thumped to death his entrails bruised as they be melt inside his entire skin this done he is left in the place afore prepared and under his sides are put bits of bells and thyme and fresh plucked rosemary and all this doth take place at the season when the zephyrs are first curling the waters before the meads be ruddy with their springtide colours and before the swallow that little chatterer doth hang her nest again the beam in time the warm humour beginneth to ferment inside the soft bones of the carcass and wonderful to tell there appear creatures footless at first but which soon getting unto themselves wings mingle together and buzz about joying more and more in their airy life at last burst they forth thick as raindrops from a summer cloud thick as arrows the which leave the clanging stringers when the nimble parthians make their first battle onset for a study in the persistence of delusions this affords us some very promising material in the first place the generation of bees from putrescent matter is and must always have been an impossibility if there is one thing that the honey-bee abhors more than another it is carrion of any description indeed putrid odours will often induce a stock of bees to forsake its hive altogether so it cannot even be supposed that bees would venture near the scene of virgil's malodorous experiment and thus give rise to the belief that they were nurtured there but not only was this practice a recognised and established thing in virgil's time but entire credence was placed in it throughout the middle ages down in fact to so late a time as the seventeenth century it is on record that the experiment was carried through with complete success by a certain mr carew of antony in cornwall at an even later date still the practice moreover was of infinitely greater antiquity than even virgil supposed he was probably right in giving it an egyptian origin and this alone may date it back thousands of years in egypt the custom had a curious variant the ox was placed underground with its horns above the surface of the soil then when the process of generation was presumed to be complete the tips of the horns were sawn off and the bees are said to have issued from them as out of two funnels nearly all the ancient writers with the exception of aristotle mention the practice in some form or other varro writing half a century before virgil says 
it is from rotten oxen that are born the sweet bees the mothers of honey ovid gives the story of the egyptian shepherd aristaeus as enlarged upon by virgil and adds some speculations of his own he suggests that the soul of the ox is converted into numberless bee souls as a punishment to the ox for his lifelong depredations amongst the flowers and herbage the bee being a creature that can only do good to and cannot injure vegetation manifestly where there is so general and so widely independent a corroboration of a story some explanation must exist which will alike bear out the truth and condone or at least extenuate the error a careful examination of the various accounts of bee swarms having been produced from decaying animal matter reveals one common omission in regard to them all the writers are agreed that dense clouds of bee-like insects are evolved and speak of these as escaping into the air and flying off presumably in the immediate quest of honey but no one bears testimony to honey having been actually gathered by these insects nor is it recorded that they were ever induced to take possession of a hive as ordinary swarms of bees will readily do they are spoken of more as enriching the neighbourhood generally by augmenting the number of bees abroad than as conducing to the well-being of any particular bee owner herein no doubt is to be found a clue to the whole mystery if it was not the honey-bee the apis mellifica of modern naturalists which was generated from the entombed body of virgil's unfortunate bull calf what other insect closely resembling a bee could have been produced under those conditions the answer has been readily given by several naturalists of our own time there is a fly called the drone fly which exactly meets the difficulty he is so like the ordinary honey-bee that on one occasion and that recently he was mistaken for the genuine insect by one calling himself a bee expert and holding a diploma officially entitling him to the use of that name this drone fly would have behaved almost exactly as virgil's calf-bred bees are said to have behaved and according to the various descriptions of the matter given by other writers living before and since he would issue forth in a dense cloud immediately his natal prison doors were opened and he would comport himself in other ways exactly as enumerated finally he would beget himself joyously to the open country as a swarm of bees would do and once more the virgilian theory of bee production would meet with its seeming verification but having gone thus far with the drone fly it is difficult to resist going a little farther we cannot leave him in the ignominious company of slaughtered oxen but must give him his due of more lordly associations out of the eater came forth meat and out of the strong came forth sweetness when samson went down to timnath on his fateful mission of wooing and saw the carcass by the way beset with a cloud of insects we need not cast any doubt on his genuine belief that they were honey-bees he propounded his riddle in all good faith and the form of it can very well be explained as a not undue stretch of allowable poetic privilege but that the creatures he saw hovering about the dead lion were really bees and that samson actually obtained honey from the carcass 
is not to be accepted without the exercise of a faith that is undistinguishable from credulity many attempts have been made to explain away the difficulties of the problem on natural lines but they are all alike unconvincing there is little doubt at this time that the part of the story dealing with the honey is nothing but a deft embroidering on the original legend by some later chronicler and that the insects which were seen about the dead lion were really drone flies generated in the same fashion as those from virgil's ox perhaps no better general idea is to be obtained of the condition of bee knowledge among the ancients than from the writings of pliny the elder who was born in a d twenty three he too deals with the oxborn bees but the reader's interest will centre for the most part in pliny's grave and careful account of the life and customs of the honey-bee as commonly accepted among his contemporaries very few indeed of the facts he so picturesquely details have any real foundation in truth like nearly all the classic writers he had little more accurate knowledge of the life within the hive than we have of the bottom of the pacific ocean but he made up for this deficiency as did all others of his time by dipping largely into the stores of his own fancy as well as those of other people his account of the origin and nature of honey is quaintly pleasant reading honey he says is engendered from the air mostly at the rising of the constellations and more especially when sirius is shining never however before the rising of the virgilii and then just before daybreak whether it is that this liquid is the sweat of the heavens or whether a saliva emanating from the stars or a juice exuding from the air while purifying itself would that it had been when it comes to us pure limpid and genuine as it was when first it took its downward descent but as it is falling from so vast a height attracting corruption in its passage and tainted by the exhalations of the earth as it meets them sucked too as it is from off the trees and the herbage of the fields and accumulated in the stomachs of the bees for they cast it up again through the mouth deteriorated besides by the juices of flowers and then steeped within the hives and subjected to such repeated changes still in spite of all this it affords us by its flavour a most exquisite pleasure the result no doubt of its ethereal nature and origin modern beekeepers ascribe the varying quality in honey nowadays to the prevalence of good or bad nectar producing crops during the time of its gathering or to its admixture with that bane of the apiculturist the detestable honeydew but pliny set this down entirely to the influence of the stars when certain constellations were in the ascendant bad honey resulted because their exudations were inferior honey collected after the rising of sirius the famous honey star of all the ancient writers was invariably of good quality but when sirius ruled the skies in conjunction with the rising of venus jupiter or mercury honey was not honey at all but a sort of heavenly nostrum or medicament which not only had the power to cure diseases of the eyes and bowels and ameliorate ulcers but actually could restore the dead to life similar virtues were possessed by honey gathered after the appearance of a rainbow 
provided as pliny is careful to warn us that no rain intervenes between the rainbow and the time of the bee's foraging of the life history of the honey bee pliny wrote voluminously he tells us of a nation of industrious creatures ruled over by a king distinguished by a white spot on his forehead like a diadem these king bees were of three sorts red black and mottled but the red were superior to all the rest he appears to accept though guardedly the old legend that sexual intercourse among bees was divinely abrogated in favour of a system of procreation originating in the flowers he mentions a current belief which must have been the boldest of heresies at the time that the king bee is the only male all the rest being females the existence of the drones he explains away very ingeniously they would seem he says to be a kind of imperfect bee formed the very last of all the expiring effort as it were of worn out and exhausted old age a late and tardy offspring the discipline in the hives was according to pliny a very rigid affair early in the morning the whole population was awakened by one bee sounding a clarion the day's work was carried through on strict military lines and at evening the king's bugler was again to be observed flying about the hive uttering the same shrill fanfaronade by which the colony was roused at daybreak after this note was heard all work ceased for the day and the hive became immediately silent his book abounds in curious details as to hive life when foraging bees are overtaken in their expeditions by nightfall they place themselves on their backs on the ground to protect their wings from the dew thus lying and watching until the first sign of dawn when they return to the colony at swarming time the king bee does not fly but is carried out by his attendants pliny warns intending beekeepers not to place their hives within sound of an echo this being very injurious to the bees but he adds the clapping of hands and tinkling of brass afford bees a special delight he ascribes to them an astonishing longevity some living as long as seven years but the hives must be placed out of the reach of frogs who it seems were fond of breathing into hives this causing great mortality among their occupants when bees need artificial food they are to be supplied with raisins or dried figs beaten to a pulp carded wool steeped in wine hydromel or the raw flesh of poultry wax pliny says is best clarified by first boiling it in sea water and then drying it in the light of the moon for whiteness and in taking honey from the hives a person must be well washed and clean malefactors are cautioned against approaching a hive of bees at any time bees he assures us have a particular aversion to a thief to the latter-day practical beekeeper all these minute details given by the classic writers read very like useless and cumbersome nonsense and it seems matter for wonder that the bees contrive to exist at all under such ingeniously complicated mismanagement born as it was of an ignorance flawed by scarcely a single ascertained fact but the truth stands out pretty clearly that bee-keeping two thousand years ago 
was really a very large and important industry one apiary is mentioned by varro as yielding five thousand pounds of honey yearly while the annual produce of another brought in a sum of ten thousand sesterces pliny mentions the islands of crete and cyprus and the coast country of africa as producing honey in great abundance sicily was famous for the good quality of its beeswax but corsica seems to have been one of the main sources of this when the island was subject to the romans it is said that a tribute of two hundred thousand pounds weight of wax was yearly exacted from it this however is such an astounding figure that it must be taken with a certain caution evidently the bees in the ancient world managed their business in fairly good fashion in spite of the ignorance of their masters or at least of the ancient chroniclers dure rustica but it should always be borne in mind that the writers on husbandry and kindred subjects were seldom practical men with the single exception perhaps of virgil's georgican these old books relating to apiculture bear unmistakable evidence of being for the most part merely compilations from writings still more ancient or heterogeneous gatherings together of hearsays and current fables of the time it is certain that the men who were actually engaged in the craft of bee-keeping and who knew most about it wrote nothing at all probably they concerned themselves very little with the myths and fables of bee-craft and owed their success to hard practical everyday experience which is the surest and perhaps the only guide today end of chapter one chapter two of the law of the honey-bee by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain the isle of honey if we are to accept all that the old roman historians have put on record to the glory of their race we must believe that their conquering legions found everywhere barbarism and left in its place the seeds of a high civilization high at least in the general acceptance of the word in those lurid moving days but it may well be questioned whether the britain that caesar first knew was as barbaric as it has been painted we are accustomed to look upon caesar's account of his earliest view of albion of ellenban the white island as the britons themselves called it as the first glance vouchsafed to us into the history of our own land but this is very far from being the truth british history begins with the record of the first voyage of the phoenicians who adventuring farther than any other of their intrepid race chanced upon the scilly isles and the neighbouring coast of cornwall and thence brought back their first cargo of tin and how long ago this is who shall say the whereabouts of the phoenician barat anak the country of tin remained a secret probably for ages jealously guarded by these ancient mariners the first true seamen that the world had ever known they were expert navigators venturing enormous distances over sea even in king solomon's time and that was a thousand years before the advent of caesar in all likelihood they had been in frequent communication with the britons centuries before the greeks took to searching for this wonderful tin-bearing land and still longer before the name 
barak anak became corrupted into the britannia of the romans and it is hardly to be supposed that a people of so ancient a civilization and of so great a repute in the sciences and refinements of life as the phoenicians a people from whom the early greeks themselves had learned the art and practice of letters could remain in touch century after century with a nation like the britons without affecting in them enormous improvement and development in every way that would appeal to so high-mettled and competent a race for high-mettled and capable the britons were even in those old dim far-off days caesar's account of them read between the lines accords ill with the commonly accepted notion of a horde of savages pigging together in reed hovels and daubing their naked bodies blue to strike terror into the equally savage minds of their island adversaries we get a glimpse of a people much farther advanced in the arts of peace and war in all probability they clothed themselves at ordinary times picturesquely enough in the furs of the wild animals with which the island abounded and it was only in war time that they stripped and painted old prints have familiarized us with the sight of the sailors of drake and nelson stripped much in the same way and the blue paint of druidical times is not divided by so great a gulf as the ages warrant from the scarlet cloth and glittering brassware of nineteenth-century fighting men as armourers the ancient britons must have been not immeasurably inferior to the romans and we are told that they excelled in at least one difficult craft the making of all sorts of basket ware but there is other testimony apart from caesar's in favour of the view that they were by no means a barbarous people diodorus siculus who was caesar's contemporary speaks of them as possessing an integrity of character even superior to that commonly obtaining among the romans and tacitus writing about a century later ascribes to them great alertness of apprehension as well as high mental capacity protected as they were by the sea it is probable that war entered to no large extent into their lives and they were essentially a pastoral people the cultured and daring phoenician traders are certain to have prospected the coast much farther eastward than is recorded and thus to have materially hastened british advance in civilization at least as far as the southern tribes were concerned it has been claimed on what evidence it is difficult to determine that the romans besides teaching the britons all other arts of manufacture and husbandry introduced the practice of bee culture into the conquered isles but pliny giving an account of the voyages of pythias which are supposed to have been undertaken some three hundred years before caesar ever set foot here mentions the geographer of marseilles as landing in britain and finding the people brewing a drink from wheat and honey there is however another source of testimony on this point of infinitely greater antiquity than any yet enumerated long before the phoenician sailors discovered their tin country there were bards in ellenban the white island hymning the prowess of their celtic heroes and the traditional doings of their race these old wild songs were handed down from singer to singer through the ages and many of them still extant among the records of the welsh bards 
must be of unfathomable antiquity these profess to describe the state of britain from the very earliest beginnings of the human race and in some of them which are seemingly among the oldest britain is called the isle of honey because of the abundance of wild bees everywhere in the primeval woods there would be little profit and no little folly in seeking to invest these old traditions with any more than their due significance but there is much in the name and it may be conjectured that if britain was known among the early druidical bards as the isle of honey the natural conditions giving rise to the name were still prevalent and reflected immemorially in the life of the people when caesar first saw them crowding the white cliffs above him a huge-limbed ruddy-locked warlike race he records that they possessed their herds of tame cattle and their cultivated fields and it is reasonable to suppose that the hives of wattled osier that virgil wrote of a century later had their ancient counterpart of woven basket hives in the british villages of the day no doubt the romans during their second and permanent occupation which did not take place until a hundred years after taught the britons their own methods of bee management and improved in numberless ways on the practice of the craft which among the british was probably a very simple and rough and ready affair but it was not until the romans had gone and the anglo-saxon rule was fairly established in the island that bee-keeping seems to have become one of the recognised national industries the records bearing on the social life of the people at that time are necessarily broken and scanty but it is certain that honey with its products had become an important article of diet among all classes high and low it is difficult here in the present time when cane and beet sugar and even chemical sweetening agents are in constant and universal use to realize that from the remotest times down to the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries there was practically no other sweet food of any description except honey in the world and to estimate therefore what a prominent place in the industries of each country beekeeping must then have occupied there was nothing else but honey for all purposes and it is constantly mentioned in the old monkish chronicles and the curious manuscript cookery books that have survived from the middle ages it is true that the sugar-cane was known as far back as the first century a d strabo writing just before the commencement of the christian era relates how nearchus who was admiral of the fleet to alexander the great made an important voyage of discovery in the indian ocean and brought back news of the wonderful honey-bearing reed which he found in use among the natives of india there is a record that the spaniards brought the sugar-cane from the east and planted it in madeira early in the fifteenth century thence its cultivation spread to the west indies and south america during that and the following century throughout the middle ages it was in very restricted use among the richest and noblest families in europe venice being then the centre of its distribution but cane sugar was little else than a costly luxury of diet or a vehicle in medicine even among the highest in the land until well into the seventeenth century when it slowly began to oust honey from the popular favour the chances are however that the middle and lower classes of england possessed and could afford no other sweetening agent but honey for any purpose 
down to about 300 years ago. Among the Anglo-Saxons, the beehives supplied the whole nation, from the king down to the poorest serf, not only with an important part of their food, but with drink and light as well. We read of mead being served at all the royal banquets, and in common use in every monastery. Even in those far-off days, there were wayside taverns where drink was retailed, and the chief potion was mead, although a kind of ale was also brewed. No priest was allowed to enter these hostelries, but this could scarcely have been a great deprivation, as the home allowance of mead was a sufficiently generous one. Ethelwald's allowance to each half-dozen of his monks at dinner was a sextarium of mead, which, in modern measure, would be probably several gallons. There were three kinds of liquor brewed from honey in Anglo-Saxon times. The commonest, or mead proper, which may be taken as the usual drink of the masses, was made by steeping in water the crushed refuse of the combs after the honey had been pressed from them. This would be strained and set aside in earthen vessels until it fermented and became mead. And the longer it was kept, the more potent grew the liquor. Another kind, made from honey, water, and the juice of mulberries, was called morat, and this, presumably, was the beverage of the more well-to-do. A third concoction, known as pigment, was brewed from the purest honey, flavoured with spices of different sorts, and received an additional lacing of some kind of wine. Probably this was the mead served at the royal table. The office of king's cupbearer could have been no sinecure in those days, for it was the custom of Anglo-Saxon monarchs to entertain their courtiers at four banquets daily, and the quantities of liquor which the old records tell us were consumed on these occasions seem incredible, even in the annals of such a deep-drinking race. Not the least valuable outcome of the Norman conquest, as far as the national temperance was concerned, must have been the reform instituted in these court orgies by William I, who reduced their number to a single state banquet daily. If it may be supposed that the reign of Harold marked the summit of popularity for our good old English honey-brew, it is equally certain that with the coming of the Normans began its slow decline in the national estimation. Following in the trail of Duke William's nondescript army came the traders, with their outlandish liquors from the grape, and wine must soon have taken the place of the Saxon mead, first among the foreign nobles and later among the native thanes. From that day, mead has steadily declined in vogue, and today mead-making is practically a lost art, surviving only among a few old-fashioned folk here and there in remote country places. But it is still to be obtained, and those of us who have had the good fortune to taste good old mead, well matured in the wood, are sure to feel a regret that no determined effort is being made to rehabilitate it in the national favour. Perhaps there is no more wholesome drink in the world, and certainly none requiring less technical skill in the making. All the ancient books on beekeeping give receipts for its manufacture, differing only in the variety of foreign ingredients added for its improvement, or, as we prefer to believe, to its degradation. For the finest mead can be brewed from pure honey and water alone, and any addition of spices or other matter 
serves only to destroy its unique flavour some of the sixteenth and seventeenth century bee masters were renowned in their day for their mead brewing and one of the foremost of them claims for his potion that it was absolutely indistinguishable by the most competent judges from the old canary sack he gives careful directions for the manufacture of his mead and these can be and have indeed recently been followed with complete success this mead when kept for a number of years froths into the glass like champagne but stills at once leaving the glass lined with sparkling air bells it is of a pale golden colour and has a bouquet something like old cider but its flavour is hardly to be compared with any known liquor of the present time it is interesting however to have its originator's authority for its close resemblance to canary sack as this gives a clue to the intrinsic qualities of a wine long since passed out of the popular ken End of chapter two